Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to uh, welcome you to the second session of the Baker Institute Student Forum. Uh, we inaugurated this series with Tom Friedman, and uh, we now have a very distinguished uh, speaker. Uh, and I am going to ask Sean Leventhal to introduce our speaker, who has very uh, generously uh, volunteered to get into a discussion with you after his uh, a uh, short initial presentation, answer any questions, and I encourage a dialogue. Uh, Sean Leventhal. I'm really glad that we have such a great turnout and all the students are interested in what we're doing and we're working really hard to um, try to get as many students involved in the Institute as possible. We are honored today to have Sir Christopher Meyer, the Ambassador for the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland to the United States. Ambassador Meyer was made a Knight Commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George in the 1997-98 New Year's Honors. He is a career diplomat and statesman who has been posted to Brussels, um, to the UK representation of the European communities, where he specialized in trade policy. He's worked in London for the Foreign Office um, for the Foreign Secretary. Um, he has been a visiting fellow at Harvard, as well as um, being the president, uh, excuse me, being the spokesman to the Prime Minister in 1994. Um, ambassador Meyer was most recently um, British ambassador to the Federal Republic of Germany in 1997. Um, we are so glad that he's with us today, and I'm gonna turn it over to him, um, Ambassador Meyer. And he's also an honorary Texan, where do you see this? Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Sean, for that very that, that 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 introduction. You know, whenever I go around the United States, I arrive wherever it is, and I say, "I'm really pleased to be here, and I'm thrilled to be in wherever it is." And I can see a look of sort of jaded cynicism over the faces in front of me, saying, "You would say that, wouldn't you?" But over here at Texas, I am putting my money where my feet are, and I want you to see this to show my tangible <laughs> delight at being in Texas, which is a very fine pair of cowboy boots here. And la pièce de résistance, as the French would say, is that. <laughs> So, only problem with this is I walk with extreme difficulty, and if I suddenly disappear behind the podium like that, don't be too alarmed, it's just because I've, I've lost my balance. Anyway, where was I? Well, I wasn't anywhere, really. Um, I'm the British Ambassador of the United States. I've been in this job now for coming up for five years. I will finish my term at the end of February next year when I retire from the diplomatic service and fade away into the sunset, hoping that another sun will rise on me um, as I return to, return to the UK. Um, and uh, I'm trying to sort of get together my thoughts about what this American experience uh, adds up to, and I'm still in a very incoherent state, and I'm looking forward to your questions to me to try and bring out some of the thoughts which are lying latent but disorganized um, in, my, uh, in my head. The founder of... Uh, of British diplomacy, of modern British diplomacy, a fellow called Sir Henry Wootton, who was extremely active at the end of the uh, 16th and the 16th century, early 17th century. So I'm, I'm really contemporary in my talk about British foreign policy. Um, he, once, he once defined an ambassador as an honest man sent to lie abroad for the good of his country. Well, I can tell you not much has changed since then, and uh, I've much enjoyed truly enjoyed lying abroad for the good of the United Kingdom in the United States. The career is not quite, quite what it was in the early 17th century. I mean, we still do, as diplomats did then, a good old war and peace, and we can talk about that. But the interesting thing for those of you who are considering a career in the Foreign Service, and I guess the American Foreign Service in this respect is not hugely different from the British Foreign Service, you now do, whether you're ambassador or desk officer or whatever, pretty well every area of public policy. And the reason for this is, particularly between Britain and the United States, and the reason for this is in things like the environment, energy, health care, crime prevention, uh, defense uh, equipment sales, 
uh, welfare to work, uh, you name it, we are working with some bit of the United States on best practice and how to do these things better. <clears throat> this doesn't always happen at the federal level. It can happen at the state level. It can happen at the municipal level, actually. But I'm engaged. I run an operation which does all these things. And this is uh, a fairly new development over the last 10 to 15 years. And it doesn't matter who's in power, whether it's a Democratic administration or a Republican administration. This stuff um, goes on uh, uh, a pace, and that is the new diplomacy. And so we lie abroad in a much more comprehensive way than we used to, but we still do the core issues. And of course, if you're talking about war and peace and security, the things that have preoccupied diplomats traditionally for a long time, then of course the focus comes to Iraq, on which um, we, can, we can talk in, uh, in, in a minute. Uh, the only other thing I would say before throwing this open to questions is uh, people often ask me, how is it, uh, I mean, those of you who follow uh, European affairs and uh, European foreign policy, you probably will have noticed that the current government for which I work, and I'm not a political appointee, I'm a career diplomat, nobody has the faintest idea in London how I vote, uh, and, or even whether I vote. Uh, you know, that's, this is, you know, some people find it very odd that I could have been the press secretary to a conservative prime minister in the shape of John Major, um, and then Tony Blair's ambassador to the United States. Well, that's just the way our system works. Um, but you will have noticed that under Blair, the British government has been much more aggressive in the best sense of the word to try and play a true leadership role inside the European Union, to be much more positive to, uh, towards British, Britain's relationship with the European Union and to get us out of the um, somewhat uh, cantankerous relationship which we had with our continental European friends uh, under the previous um, government. And that's worked pretty well. It's worked very well, actually. So a lot of Americans say to me, well, does that mean you've got a weakening in your relationship with the United States of America? To which the answer is, this is not a zero-sum game. And if there's one thought I can leave you with, it is this, is the cornerstone of British foreign policy today, beginning of the 21st century, is to see gr more aggressive leadership and deeper engagement in Europe as being entirely complementary uh, with a very close partnership with the United States of America. Indeed, we see these two things as being mutually reinforcing. And so, in our view, the more effective we are in Europe, the better ally we are to the United States. And the better ally we are to the United States, the more effective we are in Europe. And by doing these two things together, we satisfy best what is the strategic objective of British foreign policy, namely to, to safeguard and to advance our national security and our national um, prosperity. It was General de Gaulle who said that we had to choose. He said you've got to choose between your European vocation and your transatlantic vocation. You can't have both. And our answer over the decades is yes, we can have both and you should have both and this is the way to strengthen and move forward the community, if you like, of transatlantic relations. So I'm not going to say any more. I've spoken more, I think, than Tom Friedman did. Um, I just want to, he's a good friend, he's a great man, he's terrific. Um, what a privilege to know him. Um, I'm going to stop, and I'd just like you to throw any questions that you wish at me, and let's just have a discussion going. Voila, sir, at the back. How do you imagine that igniting a conflagration in the Middle East will uh, advance Britain's, um, I believe you said, security and prosperity? I said safeguarding and advancing our national security and prosperity. It's, more, it's a more to your question. Was that it? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, right. I'm asking how, how will... How do we do that? Well, no, no. How will, it, how will prosecuting yeah. a, an attack yeah. upon Iraq at this time... Yeah. How will that safeguard and advance yeah. the security and prosperity of the United Kingdom? Terrific question. I'll try and give you a terrific answer to that. Um, let's uh, begin at the beginning on this. War is uh, the means of last resort. It's certainly the means of last resort. 
in this case. The United Kingdom's policy is to make the maximum best faith effort that we can through the mechanism of the Security Council to lead to the disarmament of Saddam Hussein as laid down by the terms of the ceasefire in 1991 and successive Security Council resolutions since then. Now, if you're saying to me, do we regard preserving and developing the integrity and credibility of the United Nations as a foremost objective of British foreign policy? The answer is absolutely yes. We are now in a situation where 11 years after the ceasefire of 1991, which brought to a conclusion a war that was waged because Iraq had seized Kuwait, but Saddam Hussein is still in defiance of those resolutions. So the issue is, how do you bring him and Iraq back into compliance? Because if we go on in the way that we have been going over the last 11 years, the logical conclusion will be to end up with the United Nations uh, no more effective with no more teeth than the League of Nations of Blessed Memory. Now, one of the rules that you learn uh, in foreign policy and diplomacy is that quite often diplomacy, unless it is backed by the credible threat of force, is itself a toothless tiger. We learned that, I think, in Kosovo, and we've learned this um, in other situations over the years. So you can, in fact, uh, derive a rule which says this. It doesn't apply to all occasions, but the more you are seen to be preparing for war, the less likely you are to have to wage it. One of the arguments that the British government had with Bill Clinton back in, uh, back in 1999 was over preparing for the contingent need that we might need to put in ground troops into Kosovo before we had reached a political arrangement with Milosevic. Clinton didn't want to do this. We did. The argument, the more you are seen to be preparing for war, the less likely you are to have to use it. And I think in the end we were proved right and, uh, um, and the then president was proven wrong. So to come back to the current situation, uh, we want to use the UN. We want to reinvigorate the Security Council. We want a very tough Security Council resolution. We are working on this now with uh, the French, uh, the Chinese, and the Russians, which provides for three things. One is to make it plain that Saddam Hussein is now in material breach of whatever it is, 15, 16, 17 Security Council resolutions. That secondly, these are the arrangements that are going to take place for the inspections under Mr. Blix, and they've got to be much tougher and with much less scope for wiggle room than has been the case so far. And thirdly, the resolution, in some way or other, must make plain that there will be consequences if Saddam Hussein uh, does not respect this Security Council resolution. So the way I would put it to you is this. No one is interested in a conflagration in the Middle East, but there comes a point when you cannot have somebody like him cocking a snook. Do you use that phrase in American? <laughs> cocking a snook at the international community and the UN. And we consider it to be very much in our national interest that the authority of this organization is upheld. If the United States either fails to get the Security Council resolution that both of you are seeking, or if it feels that, the, that a resolution is not strong enough and decides to start a war without the sanction of the United Nations, 
what resources is the British government prepared to give to the United States and to, to whatever international coalition it can build? Well, I'm going I'm to violate a principle that I used to always have when I was a press secretary, which was never to answer journalists' hypothet hypothetical questions, but uh, that would be the cowardly dodging of what you're asking. But I can only answer so far, because you know, the crystal ball is not entirely clear here. What we say, we, the British government, say is this. And we've been you know, working on this issue for years, preceding 9-11. But 9-11 has, has an impact here. What we say is this, that doing nothing about Saddam Hussein is not an option. The only question is, what do you do? Before 9-11, we worked with your government and with others to tighten the sanctions regime uh, and to improve the oil for food program. So you make a difference between the Iraqi people as a whole and the regime. I think what 9-11 has done, it certainly had a terrific impact on the British Prime Minister, on Tony Blair, is to tell us that you've got to have a far more forward-leaning approach, preemption, if you like, to dangers which may be, at the time, not much larger than the size of a, a cloud the size of a man's fist on the horizon, but before you know where you are, it could be something which is extremely dangerous. And again, and in Tony Blair's view, and he's, he's said this many, many times over the last few months, doing nothing about Saddam Hussein is not an option. So, we're trying to get the Security Council to rise up to its responsibilities. Now, the interesting thing in the United Kingdom, I will get the answer in a minute, but it's, it's quite complicated. The interesting thing in the United Kingdom is the polling. What are the polling? What, is, what are the polls telling us about British opinion? They tell us that on the whole, the Prime Minister is way out ahead of British public opinion, parliamentary opinion, even in his own party, maybe even in his own cabinet. But when you break the questions down and say, if there is a military operation undertaken under UN cover, undefined, then the number of people who would support it are significant. It's somewhere between 60 and 70 percent, depending on which poll you look at. Take away the UN thing entirely, no UN cover, then the numbers go plummeting down. And I think it's something similar here in US polling, if I'm, if I'm right. Now, the issue is this. If we fail to get the agreement of the P5 and the wider Security Council to the kind of resolution that we want, we want what then happens? It's the big issue. It's the real well, nutcracker. And the answer to that, I think, does depend on how this train wreck takes place. Because in our view, in the UK, the important thing is to be seen to be making and to make a real good faith effort to get the Security Council to do what it probably should have done in 1998, if not earlier. And in those circumstances, we could very realistically envisage that a coalition of the willing, a la Kosovo, will then take action. Who will be in that coalition of the willing? I have no idea. I don't know. I can't tell you. And I can't say more than that at the moment. I, we do not think it likely or probable that a situation will arise where the United States is left in splendid isolation with a wreckage of God knows how many drafts of resolutions around it, if drafts can have wrecks, and that then we, the United Kingdom, will be confronted with a dilemma. Do we go with the US or don't we in those circumstances? I don't think it will come down to that. I think one way or another, there will be a coalition of the, if Saddam is not stu is stupid as we expect him to be, uh, there's, there's another very interesting scenario as if Saddam is super clever, unlike anything he's ever done before. But I think in a situation where we can't get a resolution through, there will still be a very significant number of people who are you know, prepared to do something. So I don't think the worst case scenario, which you've just spelled out, which the pundits adore in Washington, will actually come to pass. So. Hi. Um, I'm a student of uh, British geopolitics. Uh, going back to the 19th century, the idea of 
you know, dividing the Eurasian landmass uh, to maintain British power. Yeah. Um, what I see going on now with this Iraq war is you have the American policymakers. Basically, it's kind of an extension of British 19th, early 20th century geopolitical power and policy uh, into the Eurasian heartland. What I was wondering um, was that now it's, it's becoming more and more of an American-dominated empire. Are circles in Britain or yourself a little bit miffed, in a sense, at having to follow along behind a rather unintelligent American group of policymakers like Richard Pearl, Dick Cheney, Paul Wolfowitz. These aren't very intelligent people. Um, so well, I, what I, uh, I'm glad you were able to put that question with a deadly serious look on your face. The, th <laughs> the one thing I like about Rice, already about Rice University students is, is that the easy questions they just give. I mean, it's a softball type of things. Uh, no, 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 exactly. I mean, uh, if you said to any American policymaker eh, that they were continuing a British imperial tradition, I mean, no, they faint. This, this would be, this would, this would be a, a hideous. In, you are actually onto something, but it's not, not what you think. Um, and I'm going to read you some quotes in a minute. This is a long way to come in to answer your question, but let, let, let me say this. One of the, one of, why is it, for example, that at, at, a, at a period of an extraordinary flowering of the British-American relationship, I mean, from Blair and Bush all down the line, why is it, alongside this paradoxically, we've just gone through or are still going through a period of some Euro-American strain, some transatlantic strain? Uh, and one of the reasons is if you have been a global superpower, as we were in the 19th century. And there is some kind of folk memory of this. And the reflexes are still in there in the, in the system. You can understand better where the United States is coming from. Let me read you something if I can find it. Um, I have two texts to read out. This, this sort of hit me like a hammer when I first came across them. I'm getting there. Please talk among yourselves. When I, here we are. I found it. <laughs> this is this is Condi Rice in uh, Foreign Affairs, uh, January 2000. I'll just take a quote, and I quote: "It is one thing to have a limited political goal and fight decisively for it. It is quite another to apply military force incrementally, hoping to find a political solution somewhere along the way. A president entering these situations must ask whether decisive force." is possible and likely to be effective. Pretty clear. Go back to the 1820s. George Canning, one of the most brilliant statesmen, uh, British statesmen of the 19th century, um, the man who said, uh, I call the new world into, what was it? Um, balance the old, I think it was. But this is what he said. And compare this with Condé's uh, uh, quote. He's talking about the dangers of getting entangled in Europe, another theme that still runs through British politics. And he said, and I quote, it will involve Britain deeply in all the politics of the continent. Whereas, this is the point, our true policy has always been not to interfere except in great emergencies and then with a commanding force. So the notion of choosing where you go, and if you decide to go, to go decisively in commanding force, is something that is certainly common to the United States now and to the United Kingdom then. It's also common to the United Kingdom now, but that's not, not the point I'm making. Now, you, you said some rude things about American policymakers. I, of course, do not represent the United States government. It's quite enough having to represent the United Kingdom government. Uh, but let me say this. Uh, let's take two cases, Afghanistan and now Iraq. We think that the way in which the United States government, led by the president, including Vice President Cheney, Secretary of State Colin Powell, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld, in their reaction to the events of 9-11 and the way in which a campaign was devised to deal with Al-Qaeda and the Taliban uh, was a model of patience and caution 
and restrained reaction. Most of the world expected, because the Americans have this cartoon caricature, the great knee-jerk reaction. A lot of people in Europe thought that on the 11th of September, on the 13th of September, I don't know, cruise missiles would be flying all over the place indiscriminately. <laughs> Didn't happen. It was carefully thought through. It was intensely debated in Washington. When Blair came over on, on the 20th of September, the day that the president addressed the joint session of Congress, and we had a dinner in the White House. And the president said, I am not going to waste cruise missiles, which cost $150 million, on tents in the sand that cost you know, $5. We're going to think about this carefully. Um, and that, I think, was the trademark um, of the Afghanistan operation. So epithets like stupidity and so forth in relation to the foreign and security policy uh, 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 leadership in the United States I think is an outrageous slur. And it's quite wrong as a matter of analysis. Now let's look at Iraq. There's been a huge debate inside the US administration about how to handle Iraq. There's a huge debate going on in, in, in the United Kingdom and I guess in other chancellors of, of Europe. This is an intensely tough issue. People have very strong feelings. Very strong feelings. We are democracies. And because we are democracies, all this stuff gets into the newspapers. And you think, Jesus, chaos, disarray, God knows what. That is what you have to live with if you're in a democracy. Now, the president, after all this stuff, came to a conclusion, went to New York on the 12th of September and made a speech. A speech which, in effect, was an ultimatum to Saddam Hussein and a challenge to the United Nations. And we thought it was a terrific speech because he said, let us give the UN a chance to do what it was designed to do after the Second World War. And if that is stupidity, I don't know what is intelligence. Please. On in the anti Americanism, where? In the United Kingdom. <laughs> yeah. And also in continental Europe. And um, at what point, say, recent protests in London that weren't reported on in the U.S. press, um, the elections in Germany, at what, at what point does this sort of popular sentiment impact European and, and British uh, foreign relations? And what point is it something that mm. Americans or American foreign policy has to, to contend with? I don't think that there is widespread anti-Americanism in Europe. I spent, the whole, uh, I spent the whole of August in France and Germany, actually, but very little time in, in, in the UK. And you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to make distinctions. You say to people, everybody wanted to know where I was on 9-11. So I tell them you know, what happened. And as you described what happened, I went up to New York very soon afterwards. I went, uh, went to see our people in our consulate in New York who were taking the brunt of trying to find out how many Brits had been killed. In the end, we lost far fewer than we, uh, than we expected. So I explained all this. And Germans and French and British friends are like stricken when they're told this. The instinctive reaction is massive sympathy for the United States, because we all know it could happen to us, and it did happen to us. We have done terrorism in Europe in a way that uh, you haven't. So never think that Europeans now in some way blame the United States for 9-11, or that that natural well of sympathy, has sort of been, you know, the tap has been turned off. It hasn't. People worry about the Middle East. People worry about uh, U.S. policy towards Palestine and Israel. We all of us have very substantial Muslim populations. That is a factor. The great march in London on um, Saturday, I think, 200,000 people, uh, I wasn't there, but I was told, comprise a very substantial proportion of British Muslims who are quite naturally anxious about what all this means. But don't take this as a kind of blanket anti-Americanism. There's just been some very interesting polling done by um, 
This did appear in the US press, and I can't remember who did it, very widely across Europe. And there's a much greater uh, coming together of European reactions to these issues to ordinary American reactions. And what I would say to you is I think there are specific issues which concern European opinion. The Middle East is one. There's anxiety about Iraq. I mean, God knows. Of course there is. This is a, you know, it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's a, it's a real tough one. Um, and there's another, there's another thing I, I should say to you in all frankness. We got used to a certain style of discourse with the U.S. administration during eight years of Clinton and Gore. And one of Bill Clinton's great skills, probably more than any, maybe more than any U.S. president, was when he was with Europeans, he sounded like a European, he walked like a European, he had this great skill to uh, uh, empathize with anybody he was with. And so we got very used to him. The style of this administration, and it's particularly its rhetorical style, is different. You know, you have to be able to talk American better to understand it, or even talk Texan, which is you know, almost as difficult as talking Finnish or <laughs> Gaelic or something like that. Um, it's a minor point, but it's quite a significant point. And people are still taking time to get used to the style and presentation of an administration, which are very different from that of its predecessors, but where the substance is actually not hugely different. So you get into this unilateralism versus multilateralism debate. It's been going on for as long as I've been a career diplomat. And I, and I was looking back, and I saw, I've sent, under Clinton, I sent three dispatches back to the Foreign Office attempting to explain so-called American unilateralism. So this hasn't suddenly, it's not a kind of virgin birth with this, with this administration. So there's an incredibly long-winded answer to your question, but what I'm trying to say is Europe is not anti-American. There are issues which disturb people. There are cultural differences that have always been there. It's not like the huge demonstrations during the Vietnam War, which pulverized European capital cities. You didn't know we near that. So you will find, if you go to London, people who will be very critical of President Bush and this administration. But they're not going to say, Americans, we just hate you. You're horrible. It's not like that. It's not like that in France. It's not like that in Germany. Well, those were pretty well publicized in the newspaper that Iraq, it was pretty well publicized that Iraq made a proposal where they would allow uh, UN inspectors back into the country. But obviously that seemed to divide the opinion of a lot of Security Council members. But I was just wondering on your comment on how wide is the gulf between what they proposed and what the original resolutions actually called for. Yeah, I mean, there is a problem, and as the Iraqis know very well, about inspection, about another round of inspection, an unlimited inspection done at Dr. Hans Blix, taking place within the framework of the old rules, which are essentially Resolution 1284, and a couple of side agreements uh, signed with the Iraqi authorities, one by, I think, Kofi Annan and the other by uh, Rolf Ekeos, which allow too many loopholes. And it's all this stuff about the presidential palaces, and you may think of sound the same as that presidential palace is like the White House or Buckingham Palace. In fact, it's a vast area, sort of stretching across, you know, equivalent of half Texas or, or something like that. So these are huge loopholes in the inspection regime. So to, to say yes to an apparently, apparent willingness to accept unconditionally inspections is actually a bit of a snare and a delusion. So our position is it wouldn't be right to let these inspections start without a new baseline. And the function of this Security Council resolution is to provide a new baseline. And in, 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 the, in the, it's basically, it says, you know, inspectors should be allowed to inspect anywhere, anytime, anyhow. And that we haven't got at the moment. Yeah, the black dark shirt, yeah. Ralph Lauren, nice, thanks, yeah. yeah. Um. I was wondering because it, it seems as though in the international community that other countries on the Security Council believe that perhaps the UK and the US are trying to push through a, a, an aggressive action towards Iraq through the UN. And I was wondering, since they, it seems that they kind of have that disposition that the UK and the US will try to go through with it unilaterally, 
Yeah. Is there any way to try to maintain the integrity of the UN by going back to a common ground and discussing it with the entire Security Council so to build a coalition yeah. where, it, where it won't seem that the US and UK just want to yeah. force their own resolution? I mean, that is exactly what, what we're about now. I mean, even today, for example, uh, Dr. Blix has come to the Security Council today uh, to report. I mean, he has said he wants a more aggressive inspection system. And uh, he has come to the Council today to discuss exactly what it is he needs to do uh, you know, a, a serious and properly intrusive um, inspection. And this is all part of trying to, uh, trying to find a common basis to which everybody can subscribe. You see, uh, think, of it, think of it this way. I mean, some wag said to me in Washington that the definition of unilateral was the United States and the United Kingdom working together, which is, you know, uh, well, it's quite a nice little debating point, but it's ludicrous. I mean, we, we, don't, we think it is, in, it is in the long term danger to the world if the Security Council and the UN ends up like the League of Nations. So if we want the Security Council to retain its credibility or restore its credibility, we've got to be able to achieve what you've just set out. We've got to reach a common understanding with the Russians and the French and the Chinese as the permanent, other permanent members and then the rest of the membership that this is the right way to go. Now, we're in the middle of a process where we are trying to reconcile differing views. The opening Russian position was, why do we need a new resolution? We've got hundreds of them already. To which our answer was, yes, but none of them lays down a procedure for a really rigorous inspection. And I think the Russians are now moved um, and agree that in principle there should be a new resolution. But then the argument comes over the terms. The French, as has been already widely publicized, agree there should be a new resolution. But they don't want to have an automatic trigger into war. They want another resolution, which, in, let's just say, Saddam Hussein doesn't cooperate. Blix comes back and says he's not cooperating. I can't inspect properly. Then the French want a second stage so the matter can be considered by the Security Council. Um, and uh, that is another issue which is being discussed. Now, there are people in Washington and people in London who worry about a second bite at the cherry, if you like, because they think this will give Saddam more wiggle room than he deserves. But in a sense, it's a false debate, because however tough this first resolution is going to be, whatever happens, Dr. Blix has got to come back to the Security Council and report. Then you're going to have a discussion. So, you know, you're near as damn it to a second resolution anyway. Um, so these are the kinds of issues that we're working out right now. The tough issues are how intrusive, how explicit in this first resolution should be the threat of military action. Now, the UN has a thousand different ways of saying this. So euphemisms and words and codes and things like that. Everybody knows what they mean. Uh, but the, the strategic objective is what you said in your question. Uh, yes, sir. but he expressed his doubts um, in our ability to reconstruct Iraq. Um, what are Britain's and the United Kingdom's priorities, and how do you envision yeah. a modern-day Iraq? Yeah, that, I mean, I've actually had exactly this discussion with, uh, with Tom Friedman, and I don't really disagree with him. See, one of the things I think... Uh, one of the things I think we, when I say we, I mean a coalition, have done in Afghanistan, we've been pretty good at winning the war, but we're pretty embryonic at winning the peace. And I think one of the lessons that we have learned from Afghanistan is that if you don't want to lose politically everything you've gained militarily by you know, a very effective uh, war fighting machine, then you've got to think as, you've got to be as focused on consolidating politically what you've achieved militarily as you were focused on the campaign itself. That has been lacking in Afghanistan. It's not only a, a, an American problem, it's the problem of all of us, trying to get our act together on this and getting the money in to help uh, Karzai and his government 
actually show around Afghanistan that it makes a difference they've got rid of the Taliban and, and al-Qaeda. So I think one of the lessons from that is that if there is going to be a war in Iraq and we get rid of Saddam Hussein and his clan, then as much attention has got to be paid as what we do afterwards as to how we do it. Um, and again, I think that is moving more slowly than it ought to be. And one of the things I've been doing from Washington is sort of kicking people, saying, you know, there's a gap here. You know, what is the answer? And great interagency machines in Washington and London sort of chewing this over internally. We need to bring this to a resolution quickly. So I, I, I kind of agree with Tom. In the Muslim world, yeah. I think that if the United States uh, could make a real difference to unwinding the violence between Israel and the Palestinians, I can think of no single thing which would have a more benevolent impact in the Muslim world. Rightly or wrongly, the United States is seen as almost 100% in the Israel camp. Now, it's, there's a lot of perception in there, but there's some substance in there. Um, and one of the things that we have said, we British, uh, in discussing Iraq with the US administration is that if it comes to a war in Iraq, there are a lot, in order to maximize the chances of this being dealt with quickly, there are a number of other things that need to be done to maximize those chances. And one of the things is a real effort to get the peace process back on the rails again. God knows the phrase peace process has been around again all the time that I've been in the Foreign Service. And Blair made a speech yesterday at the Labour Party conference in which he called for a conference of the, all the parties to take place uh, by the end of this year to energize, to try to energize something that was, in effect, is, is stalled. And it's an area of some policy difference between Europe in general and the United States. And, and, I, and I have to say that the UK and the US is not entirely on the same page on this. It's an area in which we just have to debate. Have you asked a question already? No, it's your neighbor. OK, you said that war should be a last resort, but paradoxically, the more we prepare for war, the more it's likely to be avoided because we'll be looking like a big threat or something. Well, something, it's, something crass and stupid is the implication of what you said there. Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> anyway, it's my understanding that there are a lot of people in control of American foreign policy right now that actually want a war. They don't want to avoid war. They don't share your conviction that war should be a last resort. So in the condition that they seem to concur with your belief that we should um, make ourselves as prepared for war as possible, well, how, how do you um, propose to address the conflicting issue afterwards where, uh, you know, how, how do you stop them from actually going to war, whereas you think it shouldn't be done and you think go, preparing for war is just some kind of, um, you know, like beating your chest or something. No. And they, they actually want a war. How do you propose to well, stop that from happening? This, this, is, you know, this is one of the things that diplomacy is all about. In Washington, there are people who, yes, who want to go to war. And for them, it's a question of finishing an account, closing an account that was opened back in 1991. And for them, it's a matter of faith or belief, if you like, that this is something that has to be done. They're to be found in London as well, but the less often. There are others who believe that Saddam Hussein will never cooperate in the way that we wish him to do. And that therefore, the strategic objective, which is the disarmament of Saddam Hussein and the removal of weapons of mass destruction, cannot be achieved without removing Saddam himself. 
That is not the same thing as saying we want to go to war, full stop. It is to say we don't think that in the end he's going to do what he should do and we will have no choice but to go to war. Now, the important thing is where does the point of gravity fall in policy making in any government? Now, for us, the starting point in this phase is what the President said on the 12th of September, which is a prospectus for making a bona fide, good faith attempt to try and resolve this once and for all through the United Nations. Now, I know, and I'm not going to make, mention any names, that there are people in the US administration, very senior, who are profoundly skeptical that this is the way to go. Profoundly skeptical about A, the UN itself, B, the Security Council, C, Security Council resolutions, D, inspections. There is a significant weight of opinion in Washington that is deeply skeptical about all that. But we have embarked on the path that we have embarked on. And that path is to try to make the UN work. And only in the event that this can't be done, and if Saddam Hussein doesn't cooperate, will war be entertained. This is not like First World War mobilization, where once the troop trains start running, there's damn all you can do to stop the troops being sent into battle uh, when they disembark. That's what I can say. So. Uh, President Bush spent uh, a large part of the <laughs> first uh, period of his administration doing things that were commonly thought of to be uh, fairly unilateral, uh, being, you know, pushing Star Wars, um, not being involved in a lot of things at the UN like the Small Arms Treaty, yeah. um, et cetera, et cetera, different things with the Kyoto Treaty and doing mm. a lot of things independently and refusing to work with mm. uh, the international community and the mm. UN on a lot of those issues. Um, and now he's come to the UN saying we need to put teeth back into the UN. Mm. And to me there's a, a definite duality there and even a slight bit of hypocrisy. Um, do you see uh, those different foreign policy stances and that abrupt change as taking away any legitimacy from current U.S. goals uh, at the U.N.? The short answer is no, I don't. And this duality to which you refer seems to me to have been a long-standing feature of U.S. foreign policy, which is not peculiar uh, to George Bush after all. And we can go back quite a long way in discussing this. Uh, when President Clinton was in office, I mean, we never forget Congress and all this. The Kyoto Treaty was voted down, what was it, 99 to 1, 97 to 3 by the US Senate. So that when President Bush came into power and said he wasn't going to do Kyoto, uh, this should not have come as a surprise to anybody because it was politically impossible to get the Kyoto Treaty ratified. Was he going to get up and say, the Senate are dreadful, we must get this treaty ratified? Of course not. Now, politicians, politics, the art of the possible. So a lot of our, our European friends screamed when they heard that President Bush wasn't going to ratify the Kyoto Treaty. But if they'd been following the issue, they would have known damn well it was never going to happen anyway. Um, it could have been done by this fledgling new administration in a slightly more um, smooth way. Um, and, and they recognize that now. But it, it wasn't an abrupt change of what had gone before. We had problems under the Clinton Gore with the International Criminal Court. Problems started then. Uh, I had endless discussions with Strobe Talbot, the um, Deputy Secretary of State, um, about uh, missile defense and the ABM treaty. The great debate with the U.S. administration started under Clinton. Now, you, you can say that Clinton was not hugely enthusiastic about missile defenses, but the debate started then. Uh, the Landmines Convention, it was the Clinton administration who refused to ratify it. Um, the U.N. Treaty on the Protection of the Child, I think I've got that right, I'm not sure if I have, has been unratified for decades by the U.S. government. There is a duality there. It is not peculiar to this administration. We were already starting to have problems uh, under Clinton Gore with the, um, the Biological Weapons Convention and the protocol that we've been trying to, to get agreed, which has uh, been shot out of the, 
out of the air by this administration, but I mean there's a, there's a pedigree that leads back a long way. Um, and I don't think one should get uh, too dramatic about it. I really don't. Um, there is this duality. You can argue that it's hypocritical. It's the way it is. It's the way it is. And our role as a, as a friend and ally is to say to the United States, if you want, on whatever issue, to get from A to B, these, in our view, are the things you need to do to make that path as direct and as smooth as possible. And on, on Iraq, um, let me put it this way, the US administration has accepted that argument, albeit, albeit that there are dissidents and grumblers inside the machine. democratic uh, process was followed through in Iraq, it would most likely lead to a fairly conservative Shiite Muslim government, which um, would somewhat go contrary to the Bush administration's war on terrorism. So do you know or can you comment on if any plans for government in Iraq post-Saddam um, would include democratic process to what extent? Yeah, it's, it's, you're, you're absolutely spot on with that question in the sense that it goes back to an earlier question. This has not been thought through. I mean, it's churning around in the agencies in Washington and in London. You're right. If you had one man, one woman, one vote, you'd end up with a Shiite government, almost certainly. And then you've got the linked issues of how do you keep the Kurds inside a unitary Iraq? <coughs> What are the Sunni generals, officers, military going to do about this? How do you keep this thing going? Is there a Karzai figure, roughly equivalent, somewhere in Iraq? How do we do all this? And that is another reason why we think UN cover is so important. It's important for a military campaign itself and justifying it. It's probably more important for afterwards because if it is going to be necessary for, say, coalition forces, I don't know who's going to be in this coalition, to stay in Iraq to ensure some modicum of stability, how, does the, how do they articulate with a new government in Baghdad? How is it done? I wish I could come here and give you the answers. I haven't a clue the way it's going to come out. All I can say to you, it's being debated, discussed. Ed? We are, we are involved in the Baker Institute in this question. Yeah. Yeah. Very accurately. And the Baker Institute has been asked by Council of Foreign Relations in New York yeah. to be the co-chair with Frank Wisdom. Oh, really? A task force really? on the day after, yeah. if we get to that point, mm. on what will it take to mm. construct the Rocky. What is the end game? All these issues that you've discussed, you're absolutely right. They have not been brought through mm. in any systematic way. And there's a real mm. issue there mm. that has to be addressed. So we're going on a fast track on this. Yeah. And uh, hopefully, if we have something meaningful to say, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll make it public. It, it is, a, it is a, you know, one of the mega questions. Uh, no, you've had it. Somebody has asked it. Yeah. And the orange. Yeah. yeah. Um, with the theme of good and evil that was used in the war on terrorism, um, and how much, and all the effort that, or that appears that we're putting into looking for solutions to problems outside, how much do you see the United States and the UN looking for problems inside? Uh, how much, uh, any issues inside of our own policy that's invoked uh, the, uh, you know, all that's happening to us and all, you know, that, am I making sense? No. <laughs> <laughs> Try again. I'm sorry. No, I don't quite understand. But I'm, I'm just asking, like, are we looking at, like, our own policy to see if there's, uh, and, like, how we treat the rest of the world mm. uh, to see if there's any flaws in that, which is actually invoking terrorism and whatnot? I mean, like, I mean, how we're handling Iraq the way, I mean, yeah, is it yeah. just all Iraq? Iraq's just messed up, and that's, I mean, that's just it, period. I mean, there's, it has nothing to do with us, and we're not doing anything wrong. Uh, or is, you know, I, I don't believe that it's that black and white. Um, not to say that... Um, yeah, I'm still not quite 
Sure, I mean, what the thrust of your question is, it, is it means, are, are we looking at the, the flaws in our own policy making, laws of unintended consequences, sure. interconnections with other issues? And we should be doing that. Yeah. And we do do that. I mean, we, we, we in the UK see a very, a very tight connection between uh, what we may have to do in Iraq and the whole conflict between the Israel and the Arabs. I think everybody sees a linkage there, for example. But there are some in the United States who believe that the path to peace between Palestinians and Israel lies through Baghdad. And if only you can remove the tyrant of Baghdad and replace him with a, a sort of democratic administration, um, then this is going to have automatically almost a benevolent effect on all the other tensions and conflicts in the Middle East. It may do. But the position from where we start in London is that uh, one of the ways in which you maximize the chances of success in, in, um, in, in Iraq is at the same time to be seen to making a real effort to bring peace to Israel and Palestine. And anyway, it's the role of diplomats and planners and people who are paid to think over the horizon to try and see these connections. There's also, I think, a very, very important role here um, for lawmakers. Uh, your, your system in the United States is very different from that. You're considering both sort of sprung from the same intellectual traditions, just to some extent. It's extraordinary how differently the US Constitution has gone off in this way and the British has gone off that way. But there are important roles of scrutiny and uh, injection of considerations which lawmakers, I think, uh, need, to, need to do. That's the function of debates in the House of Commons. You use the committee system much more in the United States. That tends to be that tends to be forgotten. And when one has a great debate about unilateralism and multilateralism, it's a permanent debate, it's never going to stop. Um, Europeans forget the role of Congress. And Congress almost genetically tends to be uh, more unilateral or more isolationist than any administration at any given time. And because of your separation of powers and the way in which you make policy, um, this is a very, very important aspect. I'm not sure about the final answer to the question. Yeah. I'm wondering about the Britain's involvement in the European Union, particularly uh, with its decision not to join the Euro, mm -hmm. and if you think that uh, a, decision, a British decision to join the Euro would have any effect on the global slowdown um, in the economy. I don't know whether we no, we spoke. Let me start again. We took a deliberate decision not to go into the eurozone and give up the pound sterling when the euro was introduced at the beginning of 1999. We didn't object to it in principle. I think the previous Conservative government did. Um, we want to see the eurozone succeed because if it doesn't succeed, then the knock-on effect on other European Union policies will be disastrous. But we couldn't, in all conscience, say that. Abandoning sterling, going into the eurozone, and this is the point, submitting our monetary policy to the European Central Bank in Frankfurt, we couldn't make a case to the British people that this would, this would produce a better economy, more productive with higher employment, lower inflation, than we had already. You see the government, and this is by both Conservative and Labour governments, the government is committed, if it decides that it is the right thing to do economically to give up the pound sterling, to hold a referendum, I mean, quite separate from the, from the elect general electoral process. And if you're going to do that, you could be pretty damn certain you're going to win a ref, because for a government to lose a referendum on the euro will probably bring it down. You probably need a general election uh, immediately afterwards. So what we're doing at the moment is we've set five economic criteria against which the pluses and minuses of adopting the euro are being examined in the UK Treasury. The Treasury is required to report no later than June next year. On the basis of that, a decision will be taken whether or not um, to make a positive re recommendation to the British people. But you see, one of, one of the, the problems is that if you look at the eurozone economy taken as a whole, 
it's performing less well than the British economy, and has been performing less well than the British economy for quite some time. Uh, our, our rates of employment, unemployment, uh, inflation, interest rates, in all these indices, nearly all these indices, are better than in the, than in the Eurozone and the European Union. So if you're going to make a camp, if you're going to have a referendum, go out, campaign, how in God's name do you make the case for the British people, except on the basis of economic theory, which cuts no ice with anybody, that it's better to be inside the Eurozone than outside? In, 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 in my view, I don't know what the Prime Minister is going to decide uh, next year. I think it'd be damn difficult to do it any time soon, so long as the British economy is performing well and it continues to perform very well. Do you think that with the do you think that if the referendum or if the decision, um, the next decision, the one that's coming up is made not to join, that it will be reconsidered at some later time? Oh yeah, I do. I think that, yes, I think there'll be a kind of, sort of constant process of review um, about this. But you see, there's another thing in in, in here that we are about, we, the European Union, are about to enlarge by a very considerable number of member states. So the whole issue is going to become incredibly, it could be much more complicated because you know, we've got 15 member states, 11 of whom are in the Eurozone. And depending on how the final stages of the negotiation go, we'll be up to 25, 27 members. That poses incredible problems of internal governance inside the EU, which are being addressed now. And then you've got the euro. Um, so all this is, is um, it's, you know, it's, a, what's the word? it's like a Rubik's Cube. It's really it's real tough. Kindly leave the stage. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to stop here. Um, excuse me. We'd like to thank you for this wonderful dialogue. And I'd like to thank students for coming and for asking such pointed and informed questions. Um, this is what the Baker Institute Student Forum is about. And we're going to continue working really hard to um, plan more events throughout the rest of the semester and the rest of the next the rest of our time at Rice and hopefully into the future um, and keep students involved in public policy and the Baker Institute. Really quickly, I want to thank the other students that are working with me on this. Dustin Stevens, Emery Ellis, Ryan Mukutla, Naveen Meej, Ambassador Trichin and Dr. Matisau for all of their, their support, their hard work, their energy and enthusiasm to making this uh, a reality. So thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, all I wanted to say is you have you make me think much harder than almost any other audience I address. And I thank you for that. And I wish all of you good luck in whatever it is you're going to be doing. Thank you.